Wow, well, thank you for that kind introduction. I think that uh, having been in the field for 30 years um, entitles me to be old, not necessarily to know uh, what's going on between your ears. But I do think that um, uh, the next wave is going to uh, uh, be about uh, personalized uh, brain management, and that's the key to health and happiness. Uh, I think that uh, what we are on the threshold of is a major scientific revolution, and it has to do with the evolution of our thinking. And many of you may have seen this progression where Copernicus effectively moved the Earth from the center of the universe, and then Darwin more recently moved man from the center of God's creation. A lot of people don't give credit to Sigmund Freud. He seems to elicit reactions of, ugh, Freud, or, ugh, Freud is fantastic. And no one has that reaction to Pavlov, for example. But, um, but Freud, I think, really did move the mind into the brain and was the first of the modern biological psychologists. Uh, and that was really the stage of evolution and thought that enabled us to make the next big leap, which is where our brain is developing the capacity to understand itself well enough to change itself. Now, the map we have on the right has all the pretty pictures on these brain images, shows how the brain has expanded through evolution. And what you can see in the very frontal part of the brain is a tremendous expansion that has occurred over evolution and that is also parallel during our own development. And it's the expansion of this cortical region that enables us the capacity uniquely to begin to understand ourselves and to change the way we think. Now, for those of you who are fans of TED, you probably have seen Ray Kurzweil's presentations. Um, there was a great TED display where Ray and his synthetic girlfriend, Ramona, put on a performance. And I don't know what you think about the quality of their music, but it was impressive that he could trot onto stage a completely digitized woman uh, who could perform with him. I'm not sure about his taste in her attire. Um, and uh, the song, I wasn't too crazy about. But I think a lot of people have agreed that Kurzweil has been quite a genius in predicting uh, the expansion of uh, uh, computing power, what's famously known as Moore's Law, in a graph that many of you have probably seen. On the uh, vertical axis of this graph is the number of uh, millions of uh, uh, instructions per second that can be executed by a $1,000 computer. So that's interesting in and of itself, and he's demonstrated clearly that this is following an exponential path. And uh, what is uh, another uh, series of minor computations about which some of us would disagree slightly or quibble about, but you can quantify what is the compute power of different kinds of organisms, starting with the, uh, the manual calculator is one of the simplest organisms, not quite as complicated as a bacterium. But if you follow uh, Kurzweil's graph, what you can see is today, the notebooks that you all have, and some of your telephones are probably approaching this capacity, are functioning at about the cognitive level of a lizard. And what Kurzweil projects famously is that in about 2029, the average uh, desktop computer will exceed for the first time the power of the human brain. And this is what Kurzweil refers to as the singularity, that point at which non-biological intelligence will exceed biological intelligence. Now, the story gets even more fantastic, um, and the nanobot I've got a picture of in the lower right, uh, nanobots, these are my favorite little fellows. The cool thing about nanobots is that they ultimately are going to be able to uh, assemble atoms to form molecules. When you can form a molecule out of atoms, what that means is you can assemble anything, anything that you want. If you wanted to have a toilet seat made of solid gold, you could have it constructed for about 50 cents a pound, because that's what atoms cost, they're cheap. The other part of that is that you can create anything that you want in the human body, including human brain parts, and you can create nanobots, according to Kurzweil, that will swim around through your brain and endow you with whatever capacities you want. Now, is that really science fiction? I think that, uh, in part, there are a few uh, unknowns in Kurzweil's predictions, um, but in my day job at UCLA, I'm involved in a, a consortium for neuropsychiatric phenomics the systematic study of phenotypes on a genome-wide scale, which is taking the next step beyond the Human Genome Project. And what scientists are beginning to do is starting with this basic set of building blocks that gives us the edge pieces in the puzzle of all biology, beginning to flesh out how our genome creates proteins, how those proteins get together, 
into the signalome, how those cells that are、uh, containing our signaling activity、uh, connect together to form complex organs like the brain, and how the brain is working. And this is laying a foundation for a new science of the mind. And a big question is, what are we going to do with that knowledge? Well, I think、uh, we're doing a lot of stuff already. We're already、uh, manipulating our brains extensively with drugs, psychotherapy, the media, and technology. So the little picture on the right shows you the distinction between internet naive and internet savvy people. I'm sure everybody here would have that brightly lit red brain on the bottom.、Um, that's from a colleague, Gary Small. I think the challenge is we're not managing our brain systematically based on understanding exactly how these things are working, and understanding our own brain biology. So right now,、uh, it's possible to go out and find all kinds of brain training exercises and other kinds of、uh, high-tech snake oil、um, that we have to、um, investigate very carefully before we begin to use. I think the next wave, we're going to know what we're doing. So I think、uh, the big question for me is what can we do in personal brain management today, or at least until the nanobots arrive and begin to uh, uh, swim around for us? And、uh, you've heard a lot today already about how to leverage existing technologies.、Uh, the World Wide Web and distributed、uh, devices are going to solve some of this problem, and we can leverage social networking problem,、uh, platforms for good instead of for evil.、Uh, and Already, we can use what we know about brain behavior relations to deploy brain prosthetic devices. And so, I'm just going to rip through a few little examples, including memory, executive function, what I call lifeline technologies, and then the IBZ to GTD. So, memory. You may say, "Oh, I've already got a bunch of prosthetic memory devices. Probably all of you have at least one on you."、Um, and the questions are, how good are those things at understanding the context? How well do they know where you are, what you're doing, and what you need to know? How well do they remind you what you did not enter? In the next wave, these memory tools are going to anticipate exactly what you want or need to remember, and they're going to prompt you to complete your brain patterns before you forget things. Now, this has the capacity to、uh, dramatically increase your capacities for memory and for inductive learning of new material. So these little、uh, shots here are from existing experiments where people have been trained to learn how to read X-ray images or how to classify artwork based on the selective presentation of that material just before people are about to forget. And by doing this kind of planned reminding,、uh, you can dramatically increase memory capacity. Now, what about executive control, the planning and decision making? I think you might、uh, agree this little chart would probably be cumbersome, especially since its purpose seems to be uh, 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 to pick somebody up at a bar. And you see, it says,、um, "Have you ever been romantically linked? Are you still together?" I think this kind of decision tree is probably not that effective. And、uh, a lot of our lives、um, is comprised of decision making. We need to learn how to inhibit those responses that we shouldn't, and there's a lot of difficult choices we need to make. And、I think the most critical thing that we face、um, is the、uh, the wimpy phenomenon, and that is uh, uh, what we really need is decision support technology. And one of the things we already know about human behavior is about delayed discounting behavior. And、uh, we all know that it's very easy to specify、uh, very sound long-term goals, like、uh, I would like to be a better person. But it's a little difficult to work on that. Like, what am I going to do today? Uh, to become a, a better person. So what we need to do is convert these long-term idealistic plans into short-term realistic goals. The little chart in the bottom right shows、um, how you discount the value of $100, and you can see it drops off dramatically over time. So what we need to do is provide people tools to be able to map their long-term goals onto these immediate schedules for action. Now, can it be done? Yes, there's already treatments available. Where folks sit down, identify long-term goals, and then go through a series of processes to align those long-term goals with things that are achievable within a week or sooner. And this has already been shown to be effective in depression, smoking cessation, alcohol abuse, and you all out there should be developing the software to make this available for everyone. What I think really ties these things together is something I refer to as lifeline technology. This is an integrated technology that will let you set your life goals. But link it to your current action planners. 
The beauty of this, and this is driven by my science side, is trying to aggregate all the information about you guys so we can use it for science. And that is we get life history, events, personal health, and all the genomic data. All that becomes input. The output is a map of your own future. And all we need are computational tools, predictive models that will show you what happens based on your current actions, and let you play out the what-if scenarios. Then a computer can help you analyze what you could do to make life better. So this is scary to me. I thought the, my uh, current image is scary enough, but if I start smoking and become obese, then it gets to be pretty, pretty bad. However, if I live better, eat well, exercise, <laughs> maintain friendships, things could turn around. And as you can see, the software still needs a little bit of work. Um, but one final thing I'll bring up is uh, something that you all may have seen. Uh, there's Merlin Man videos on the internet. It's called IBZ to GTD. And uh, what I'd like to highlight is that if we think about what we're doing today, there are brain distinctions. There's a willed intention system that generates our internal plans, and there are stimulus uh, intentions that guide our actions from the outside. Our inboxes are driving what we're doing from the outside, and we spend most of our time responding rather than from our to-do lists. So why would anybody do these things? Well, I think it's about yourself. It's better than blogging about cats that look like Hitler. <laughs> I think it's also about your future. And the best plan for the future leverages the knowledge of the past. So if we could tap this blogospheric input, we could reduce healthcare costs dramatically and probably avoid the large majority of human disease. Uh, most of which uh, can be uh, attributed to behavior. Can it happen? It's already happening. Safeway remains solvent by following these rules. Electronic medical records are already being dictated nationwide. And so I think the question is, what will you do next? So I think one option is that you can transcend your biological limitations, amplify your creativity and live happily, or the alternative. And the experience is ultimately up to you, not to the tools. Thank you very much. Thank you.